Okay, here we are. It's November 18th, 2012. We're at the Heinz Auditorium at the Boston International Book Fair. And our last interview of the day is Bud Plant of Plant and Hutchinson Books in Cedar Ridge, California. And Bud, like I ask everyone, would you give us a little biopic? Uh, tell us about your family, where you grew up, uh, brothers, sisters, what mom and dad did, where did you go to school, and uh, we'll carry it from there. Well, you have to stop me if I get too carried away. <laughs> no, we, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> All right, let's see. I'm from San Jose, California, but I moved to Grass Valley, which is basically where Cedar Ridge is, um, back in 1975. Um, my folks um, actually are sort of interesting because they met on a troop ship going over to, um, to North Africa in mm. World War II. Sort of a jack-of-all-trades um, maintenance foreman, I guess you'd call him. And my mom was an RN. Uh, but anyway, um, so they, and I have two sisters, uh, two older sisters. And um, yeah, we... We just recently sold the family house, finally, that they built in 1946 mm. with no mortgage, which was fairly nice. Wow. Yeah, but that's, things don't like that don't happen they, anymore. Yeah, that doesn't <laughs> yeah. exist anymore. Yeah, yeah. so anyway, um, that's family stuff. Um, I got involved, actually, I, I come out of the comic book area. I started uh, collecting comic books when I was a kid, about um, 11 or 12, um, and discovered there was other people that had organized and started what they call comic comic fandom, publishing yeah. Ditto and Mimeo magazines and and um, starting to sell old comics for very, very little cost back in those days. And a bunch of buddies and I uh, opened up a comic book store in San Jose in um, 1968. I would have been um, 16, 15, 15 at the time. So I used to take the bus down after school and and run the store in the afternoons. And that's sort of the be very beginnings of what, where, where it's taken me now. Um, had, had a couple more small stores that sort of came and went back in the late 60s and then started the mail order business. And um, actually a new, ma new material at that point, it was um, comic fanzines, comic book fanzines. And anything having to do with comic books, collections, Little Orphan Annie and Flash Gordon and things like that. Uh, there was a company called Nostalgia Press that started getting into doing collections like that. Now they're all over the place, but yeah. in those days, it was very little. Yeah. Um, and sold underground comics, the old Freak Brothers and Fat Freddy's Cat and <laughs> Zap Comics because they were, being, they were being published in San Francisco. Yeah. So I was 40 miles away, so I, um, it was a lot easier than dealing old comic books, which, which were sort of tough to get, you know, out in where we were and yeah. you know it was a lot easier to deal in 10 15 copies of something than just one so I got into this new business but in uh, this niche um, the comic book area opened up a uh, comic book store in 72 with a partner which ended up being seven stores chain of seven stores wow. um, that um, started out in Berkeley that was our flagship store and we had stores in San Francisco and Palo Alto and Sacramento um, and that ran on for about 15 years. Uh, but meanwhile, I kept doing the, my little mail order business, and it grew and grew, and I became a distributor um, and distributed comic books and art books and associated materials. Got more and more into the art area. Really? Um, yeah. I, I mean, I got into illustrated books, and that's sort of the beginning yeah. of my, my book career. Um, actually, Ken Sanders from good old Salt Lake City. Yeah. Ken was a, a comic book friend that I had met, and he's, he started turning me on to, to illustrated books, to nicer illustrated yeah. books. Um, and I learned, of, I actually thought that comic books were getting overpriced at the, at, back in the early 70s, yeah. which was a very foolish notion, because they were not. <laughs> but I got into illustrated books, and I said, these are much more unique and special, and they're limited editions of 500 and 250 and 1,000. That seems much more specialized than and unique than a comic, comic book that books. where they were printing 200,000 or 500,000 copies and stuff. So yeah. anyway, I But still, it. even though they printed that many copies, uh, almost that many copies got tossed. Yes, that is absolutely true. That's why, that's why people are paying some of these prices oh, for Batman yeah. and Superman and Archie it's, and God only knows Three what. comics have broken a million dollars now. Yeah. You know, it's just... It's unbelievable. Huh? Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. 
But it just goes to show you that if you have a product that people want, they're willing, they're willing to go. <laughs> Sky's the limit, man. Yeah. Yeah. When did you um, When did you open up your place in Cedar Ridge? Well, Cedar your, your, Ridge your, is your, your bookstore. Um, I'm actually in a bookstore right now in um, in Grass Valley. Cedar Ridge is just a little tiny town where we happen to have a post office. Oh, I see. It's, a couple it's miles. Grass Valley as well. It's it Grass is. Valley. I've yeah. always been in Grass Valley. Okay. Um, and we've got a co-op bookstore there. I know. I've been in it. Oh, you have? Oh, yeah. Really? Well, I, did the sacri I did the uh, the book fair out there, Grass Valley book fair. Uh, as a matter of oh, fact, one year right. I was... You were a guest, weren't you? Uh, one, one year I was the... Um, the featured person. You were the guest of honor, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. I had forgotten about that, Michael. Uh, me too. <laughs> you just mentioned it. <laughs> you didn't keep coming back. <laughs> I did. I, um, I was there for three or four years, yeah. and then I came to the stock realization that whatever I had to sell and whatever I wanted to buy, um, it, it just wasn't happening oh, yeah. at Grass Valley Book Fair. Yeah, it's a tiny, it was a tiny fair. And they've, and they've since, subsequently, um, the people who originally founded it and put it together um, turned it over to the friends of the. I was on the board of directors, so I yeah I I know what was going on with all that. They turned it over to the friends, and the friends ran it for two years, yeah, I think, and then just pretty arbitrarily pulled the plug. Yeah. And decided, and that was not a bad decision. It was a, actually it, it wasn't, but I, yeah. I think to a certain extent it hurt the trade out there because a lot of the people who in that area depended to some extent on the uh, influx of people for that one day Grass Valley book yeah. fair. Well, what I like to think, though, is that there's now two fairs a year in Sacramento yeah. um, that Jim Kay puts on. Right. And I think that, that that makes a lot more sense, to have two really good fairs in Sacramento, Sacramento rather yeah. than to have one good fair in Sacramento and one sort of mediocre fair up in our area, because we're just too far away from the metropolitan area to, to pull it off. Although I do like the Blue Moon. <laughs> <laughs> the restaurant? Yeah. 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 There's cool. a lot of ambiance up in Grass Valley, Nevada yeah, City. I, I kind of like that place. Yeah. Um, well, the cooperative, just to quickly answer your question, yeah. um, the cooperative started, oh, man, maybe a 12 years ago or something. Um, and it started out as a little hole in the wall in a strip mall. Um, and But I got involved in that maybe a couple years after it opened and said, you know, I'll just sell some of my my duplicates and have mm. one more source for them. I'd already had started um, what, what I called at the time Bud Plant Illustrated Books. Um, and a partner down in Palo Alto and I would, you know, putting out catalogs and selling at some shows. Um, so I got involved in the bookstore. And then fortunately we moved into a much better location on um, downtown Grass Valley. We've got maybe 4,000 square feet now. We That's have a nice four, area. 14 dealers, which yeah. is. But it's a true cooperative. That's what's nice about it. There's nobody that actually runs the show. Um, there's some of us that do more work than others. <laughs> well, that's true of any enterprise. Yeah, but, but we vote on everything. And it's um, actually, I keep telling myself I should write an article about the, the good, good and bad points of a cooperative because it actually has worked. And it could be a model for other people to try with well, all the shops. There are other cooperatives, shops in, in the country. We have one uh, here in. Um, Outside of Hadley, uh, they have that uh, bookstore that has like 20 or 30 people involved yep, in yeah. it. And the problem with co-ops, I've always found, is that people do not change their inventory frequently enough to keep people like me coming back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When you go back uh, at, at a year later and see pretty much the same stuff you saw the year before, it becomes a turn-off, not a turn-on. So that, that's my spiel about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I would disagree a little bit, at least in my experience with my particular co-op. I know one of the arguments also is that all, all the people in the co-ops, you know, buy all the good books. I don't think I don't, that's true. I, I don't think so either. That doesn't seem to work. We don't have a very collectible, our, our people in the co-op are not really dealing collectibles that much. It's right. more run-of-the-mill books. So we're a little more of a, you know, general reading shop. I purposely don't put expensive books down there. A seventy-five dollar book is a expensive book for yeah. me to put into that shop. So, what's your internet presence like? Uh, uh, did you find it a difficult transition? I mean, you're you're somewhat of an old timer, um, and and uh, I'm sure the internet came along at some point after you had started business, mm -hmm. and you had to put yourself in the position of either using it or not using it. How how did you go about harnessing it? Well, I pretty well embraced it. Um, we started listing our books like everybody else on, on Abe, I believe, was probably yeah. the first site to come along or 
whatever interlock the first was probably yeah. the first. I don't know if we were on interlock. That uh, may be too Richard, early. Richard Rutherford's first yeah. uh, initial yeah. attempt to match customers with with books, which has since been taken to a whole new level. Yeah, yeah. yeah so we you know we got on and and um, in fact my partner Ann Hutchison. Um, that was her beginning in the book business. Really? Was just doing the local shows down in. She was out of um, San Diego, and she would do the local shows in Southern California and sometimes in Oregon and sell on the internet. Mm. And that's so she's of that sort of new generation. Even though she's my age, she had had another career and she evolved into selling books. Um, I also embraced the internet because of my new book business, which right. is. You know, the, well, the second very, business. Very related to it. Yeah, and we so we set up a website way back at the beginning, and we've gone through you know maybe four evolutions of our website now, um, and so we've got a pretty strong presence on the internet, right. um, which is good. What percentage of your business would you say is internet related versus uh, versus book fairs or catalogs or co-ops or what have you? Is it a major, minor? Or um, well, if we're talking about the antiquarian business, um, it's probably probably only maybe 25 percent. I'd mm -hmm. say the, a big portion of our business would be book fairs, um, and then a, you know a little bit in the bookshop. How many book fairs do you do um, on an average? I think we run maybe 12 to 15 a year. Wow. Now that's also maybe including some comic books. Shows. Well, yeah, and, I'm, and I'm mainly talking mixed. antiquarian. Yeah, antiquarian. Antiquarian. antiquarian is probably um, 8 to 10, something like that. All over the country? or Pretty much on the West Coast. West Coast. Yeah, it's really tough to come back here and, and make any money. Well, you know. yeah, we, uh, your expenses and one thing or another. Yeah, this is a great, great venue for buying books, you know, both at the, the local yeah. shops and at the show itself. So and I the do Shadow a lot of Fair. Buying. And the Shadow Fair. Yeah, so that... And we really love coming back to Boston. <laughs> we really enjoy it it's here. It's a great town. Yeah, yeah, but we, you know, we put the pencil to paper and we go, oh, they're just, it's, it's really hard to actually make a profit. Yeah. You know? it, is, it is tough being transcontinental yeah. in this yeah. day and age. Well, we did the Houston Fair. The Houston Fair is always a week before this fair. Yeah. And Oscar Graham um, is an old friend of mine. We used to scout together all the time in oh. California. Oscar's a good guy. Yeah, so um, you know, so we purposely—that's one way to get together with Oscar because he doesn't come out to California very much anymore. So we always mm -hmm. go down to that fair. And Peter Stern's there, and yeah. Dennis and Dennis, and um, you know, a lot of the. F and surprisingly enough, it's a little like that Grass Valley Nevada City yeah. Fair. Yeah. People really like the show. Yeah. And they support it. Yeah, you know, maybe you'll make money and maybe you won't. Sometimes you might do really well. We actually had our best fair ever this year. Wow. So who, can, who knows? Yeah, yeah. Um, Tell me a little bit about some of the people who have had a, an influence on you as a bookseller, people uh, who may have been like a mentor, people you may have uh, asked, you know, when you were beginning, you know, how to do this or how to do what. Um, are there are there such people in your in your life? Well, in the book, sticky, sticking to the book trade rather than the comic book right. area. Um, well. I'd probably have to, to give Oscar a lot of credit because mm. I basically tagged along with Oscar a lot on book scouting <laughs> long before I joined the ABAA. He's a good companion. Yeah, yeah. And he was hanging out with, you know, um, with Maury Neville back when in Maury's, you know, yeah. Maury's heyday. And he knew everybody. And yeah. I would also, back in those days, I would help him at the shows because um, I wasn't a bookseller at that point. Right. I was just sort of a collector and a guy in the comic book area. So. In those days, I could help him at the shows, and, and so, you know, yeah, Oscar was probably a big, big part of that. I just was sort of this, this kid that really didn't know, I'm not a literature major, yeah. I can't talk about all the famous writers and stuff, but I was, you know, I could hold up my conversation if anybody brought up anything about art or comic books. Right, <laughs> you know? well, fantasy. Yeah. Um, other influences, um, I really, I really love Jim Lorson. Um, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm so, yeah. so sad. Uh, that, that Jim passed on. Uh, I just, it was a lovely place to go and visit. Yeah, yeah, he was a great bookseller. Yeah. When I joined the ABAA, I really wanted to have him as one of my sponsors. I just thought I, it's sentimental, but I thought it would be a fun thing to do. Yeah. And unfortunately, he had gone emeritus at that point, well, and he, he couldn't. He, yeah. You can't then, sponsor then he, then he stopped being emeritus. Yeah, <laughs> because he, he found out he couldn't do book fairs yeah. if he was emeritus because of the. 
the change in, in the rules. Yeah, I just thought Jim was a real, you know, he was the old school, one of the, one of the old school booksellers. And he, was, he had a lovely shop and a lovely, and a lovely uh, town, and uh, it was a jo always a joy to, to meet him. Yeah. Anybody else you can think of that um, perhaps pushed you in the right direction, as it were? That's a tough one. Um, I mean, there was just, I, I hobnobbed with a lot of booksellers. A lot of people thought I was from Houston. Yeah, and because part you were of with Oscar. Because I was with Oscar. Um, yeah, back in this area. Well, jeez. Who's the, who's the old timer that used to be in San Francisco? I'm sorry, in New York City that used to do um, catalogs? Um, There's a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. What is his you gotta name? Be, you got to give me a little more specific. I know he was Jewish. Um, you got to give me some more. Yeah, Jewish <laughs> in New York City, I'm afraid. Yeah, in okay. California, you know, the, in the you, know you might stand out, but not back here. Um, but he was one of the earliest dealers I was actually buying. I used to buy uh, Willie Pogani books from him, and he was one of the first dealers I was, was working with. Um, Milton, Milton Reisman? Reisman? Reisman, Milton Reisman, yeah. Yeah, I think that was him. New York, is that New York? Yeah, yeah, New York. Yeah, yeah. He used to do catalogs, and I visited him a couple times when I was back here on business. Um, he was a really interesting guy. He was an interesting guy. Yeah. There's lots of interesting guys. He used to be on 4th Avenue. Not anymore. Yeah, Fourth yeah. Avenue is not the not the the wonderful book area that guys like us remember from the '60s and the '70s. Yeah, it's too bad <laughs> too. Um, let me talk a little bit about uh, your transition from comic books to illustrated books. Did you find that it, it sort of flowed from one thing to another because the comic book art? just was illustrations and then illustrated books would just come next? Or, yeah. Or did, you, or did you have a uh, some kind of metamorphosis during it? No, it, it really was a flow because, you know, for, for me and for a lot of comic book people, the art is a big element. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes some people don't even bother to read the stories. They're just, just examining the, the art and how, it, how the narrative's done. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things like Lynn Ward come along that does a wordless graphic novel well, it, you couldn't call it a graphic novel, but a wordless novel back in 1930, that's very comic book-like. Um, and then there's the fantasy people, N.C. Wyeth, yeah. Maxfield Parrish, Frank Schoonover. So I just evolved really qu quickly. I was introduced to them by fellow comic book, a little bit older comic book collectors um, that were, had discovered, well, Maxfield Parrish especially was a big one. Um, you know, most, a lot of the guys I know in the comic book area you know, moved into, you know, trying to find Maxfield Parish books yeah. at the flea market, you know, yeah. which was a place I got a lot of, a lot of material back in my early days. Um, yeah, so it was a natural evolution. And like I say, the books were just really interesting. I'd started, I'd seen a lot of comic books back in the, by the early 70s, having the stores and all that. And um, then coming across these signed limited editions I mean, by Rackham or W. Heath Robinson or Willie Pogani. They just, um, you know, they had so much more, <laughs> more than, a, than a piece of popular stuff. culture yeah. like a comic book. You know, not that I'm putting down comic books at no, all. No, no, no. Uh, magnificent book productions, you know. And so, yeah, it was, it was, for me, it was a natural. And that's, and I brought that into my business. I've always tried to carry things that I really like. Um, so in, in, even in my, my new book business where I'm selling graphic novels and comic book related stuff, I'd be bringing in books on Wyatt or Schoonover and stuff, and some of my customers would scratch their heads and not understand it at all, but other ones would go, oh, yeah, oh, that's yeah, this is great. I'm, I'm glad to have a source for this sort of thing. So. Um, what do you, one of the things I also ask from time to time to guys our age is um, if some young person came to you and said, uh, Mr. Plant, I'm uh, interested in going into the book business. What would you say to them? What would you advise them to do? Rather than, rather than saying to them, don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, go into the love for it, love of it. Um, well, first, you, you want to make sure that they, they have a, a fondness or a, a, passion. a passion for something, you know, and, and to pursue that passion in whatever area, area of books they're, they're going to go into. Um, I'd advise them to start small. You know, don't go out and borrow a bunch of money. 
yeah. you know, or have your folks set you up or whatever the case would be. I mean, I think you need to, well, I would apprentice. I mean, if I was going into the book business now, I'd simply go to work for somebody Someone that else. knows what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I think that's probably the, the best thing. Learn on someone else's dime, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I saw that. Well, Maureen Neville is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jim Pepper, um, Bob Dag, probably other people, you know, spun off from, from the Maureen Neville, who sort of came and, and you know, Maury was there, a big deal for a while, and then he was gone. But, yeah. you know, you still got these guys out there. They're operating. So, yeah, I think that's a cheap way to get in. And you yeah. won't make the classic stupid mistakes like spending too much money on inventory and You're making you know, it somebody else's uh, checkbook. Well, you know, they, they've made the mistakes, so you, can, you don't have to make those same ones. You know, you can learn from it. Yeah. Yeah, Peter Howard uh, uh, in the Bay Area fostered a lot of booksellers. Yeah. And yeah. I'm sure that there are other uh, places around the country. Uh, Warren Howell, lots of booksellers came out of Howells. Yeah. Yeah. Not just domestic, foreign as well. You know, Mitsuo Mira uh, was there for a while. Uh, Michael Steinbeck, who was the former ILAD president, spent a, uh, a year working at, at Howells. And yeah. Those things don't happen anymore. And, and really, they should. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I don't see, but a little bit, a little bit. Um, like Ken Sanders, you know, has, has a guy. Um, um, Kent, that's working yeah. for him now, yeah. and Kent seems like a pretty ordinary guy, but has a passion for comics. He, he has a passion for books. Yeah, I mean for for books, and yeah, and he's it's amazing the knowledge that he already has, you know, especially about the Mormon area and that things like that. Well, you know, it's a quick learn out there, or, or you're on the way someplace else. <laughs> yeah, actually, I think he worked for um, um, who's the the um, Sam Wellers. I think oh, Kent, he, he I think Kent worked Wellers? for Sam Wellers for a while. Yeah. Well, that's. Uh, Ken Sanders worked for Sam Weller. Yeah, for a short, short time, Ken yeah. would like to tell you. Yeah, but but nevertheless, he, he still has that as part of his resume. Yeah, and Sam and Weller's is an institution. I mean, I didn't, it was a little far away from me, so I didn't really get over there, but I've always heard of him. Well, you know, if you're going to go to Salt Lake City, you can't just go there without going to, to uh, yeah. Weller's, yeah. even though they're in a new location, which I haven't been to. No, I haven't seen it either, yeah. Okay, let me ask you, uh, in the few minutes that we have left, what do you see as some of the challenges that face us as an antiquarian trade uh, going into the future? If you had a crystal ball in front of you, um, can you can you make some uh, predictions? That's a tough one. Yeah. Yeah, I heard you talking to the last, you know, uh, bookseller about, you know, getting the young people into the business. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, a, that's, that's a concern, although I... You know, again, you were mentioning there's a lot. There are a number of people, younger people out here. Yeah. Um, and, and some of them are carrying packages, which yeah, is a good sign. Yeah. And there's some second ger generation to bring up Ken Sanders again. His yeah. daughter Melissa. his daughter just broke off, and she now has her own store. Right. You know, and so that's happening a bit. Um, so I don't think it's, you know, um, it's, it's a dire concern. Um, yeah, as far as getting people into the, one of the, one of the concerns, I think, is, is price. It's really tough because so many books have gotten so expensive. Yeah. Now that's maybe true. they would have said the same thing 50 years ago, but they probably did. Yeah, they probably did. But and like you, live to regret the comic books. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it, price is a little bit of a problem. I mean, when because I've grown up through a an age where you could be almost a completionist, or you know, you could yeah, really. Yeah. You could. Um, yeah, you could go out. You want to collect N.C. Wyeth? Okay, go no out. No problem. And go ahead. It. It's not going to cost you a bloody fortune. Right. You know, or rack them. And sign limited books, you know, that were, you know. They were all over the place. Yeah, yeah. And now they're still around, but they're, you know, three, four $4,000 a piece. You, you know, you're going to be very choosy. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of a concern. Um, One of the things that, that I was told when I was young in the trade was that, uh, my perspective was very good because I didn't have a memory. And when you think about all the years you're in the trade, you remember you sold this book for $10 and yeah. now you see it for $10,000. Yeah. And sometimes that memory can get in and cloud you. That's a good point. That's a good point. You have yeah. to be careful about that. I run into that because um, in the, the, the comic book and fantasy related material area, 
I was dealing with this stuff since 1968, 1970, so yeah. I see stuff and I go, well, Ooh. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I used to sell those for cover price, you know what I mean? Yeah. And on. how much do you want for that? <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. serious? Are you serious? Yeah, so I have to catch myself on that, but yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, um, it, it may be good for people to not have that, that long-term memory what things you used to go for. And, right. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it can, it, 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 while it on one side, it's wonderful to know books because of your memory. On the other side, it's not so good to remember how much they used to go for because I think it does cloud your judgment a little bit mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, the new price range that we're running into. Yeah, yeah. But do you see us as a viable uh, oh, institution yeah. into the future? Yeah. Do you see, always see rare books as being rare books and other books just being books? Yeah, yeah, I, I still, I, I don't see it going away. I mean, I think the, the predictions of everything going to being to digital is just silly, you know. It's the same as the, the you know, the radio coming along or the television coming along. I still you listen to up, the radio. <laughs> yeah, you end up with all these different forms of information getting out, and, and the printed book is just another form. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe there won't be as many printed books, but that's no big harm. If people want to read Harry Potter on a on an uh -huh. e-book, that's fine. Candle, you didn't so. cut all those trees down, you know. I mean, yeah. cut the trees down for the few people that want to <laughs> read it in the bathtub or, you know, or have a, a hard copy of it. But I, I, I tried to read a book on Kindle. I got the first two pages, and I said, I can't do this. And I went out and bought the damn paperback <laughs> because I wanted to have something in my hands that I could I could relate to. Yeah. And I, I, I just I'm just guess it's generational. I don't know. I don't know. I I watch people walking around. I'm, planes reading books and they're not books this is a damn screen but there's still a lot of paperbacks being sold on the, in the in the airport and people oh, yeah. sitting yeah. on the plane with them yeah so. yeah so i think there's a really good place for that especially i think in college textbooks college oh, yeah. textbooks ought to be electronic absolutely so you're not robbing these poor kids of absolutely. 200 250 bucks for a book it's just you know? out of this world and then you could update book. things very easily and, and the textbooks get thrown away once they're yeah, so there, there's definitely a place for it, but yeah, I think the Anacorians here. I'm, I'm not going to go out and sell all my, all my good stuff. <laughs> no, 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 nor am I. And but we've come to the end of the line for us. Great to talk well, thanks, to you. Michael. Thanks for your perspective and enjoyed it. Well, that was a pleasure.